Welcome to the From Arias Perspective podcast. More than 10 years ago, Edie Leonard and I started our journey across the world of Estes, a universe of our own making. After collaborating on four novels that never saw the light of day, we ran our own ways. And I started working on my own universe in the realm of sci-fi, and Leonard continued exploring the world of Estes and found himself with four beautifully crafted short stories. One of these has already been released and is available for free at talesofasses.com. Now this episode will look at the lore behind those four short stories, all following the civilization of the Batharians, a warmongering society. We will look at the first idea that gave birth to this society and how this evolved. But first, how are you doing, Leonard? Well, thank you for the plug. Really appreciate it. <laughs> I'm doing fine. Yeah, a little bit of writing, a mm. little bit of drawing, a lot of working. It's just my, my nine to five job. Same old, same old. That's life, I guess. I did a lot of reading lately. Been reading a bit of uh, Aldous Huxley, Heaven and Hell, and The Doors of Perception, I believe that the, the two were called. Interesting stuff. It's very different from A Brave New World. It's first of him is documenting his experience with drugs and what he like how he went through it with like a friend. The whole creative geniuses using drugs as a way to expand their minds. Like Steve Jobs had this thing as well. It's nice to read it from a distance, but while not having to use it yourself, because it's it's nice how these people describe it, and I think that that's well, it's 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 funny <laughs> that with your ADHD, your, your mind is actually on drugs. If I if I interpret it correctly, the way that it works is that my dopamine system is quite different. But when I drink coffee, for instance, I I calm down. A very weird thing, which is how uh, in, in in the last five years I found myself at the peak drinking twelve coffees a day. Which my relationship with dopamine is just very different. Yeah, but I mean, you you get uh, when when for example Aldous Huxley used uh, uses drugs. It's, Mescaline, he he used. Yeah. Yeah, but it's it's too enhance the impulses he gets but your brain always gets these extreme impulses uh, external impulses right um it works very differently because it the masculine for instance that he uses it, it changes your whole perception so it's a, a lucigenic drug mm-hmm. so it changes the way that you look at the world that's not something that happens with me my body is like a I'm constantly on speed, basically. That's how it kind of feels like I'm, I'm, I've got a lot more energy and using something like Ritalin, which I used to use a lot in my life, uh, that calms me down because it has an opposite effect. But what I find interesting in, in reading these stories about, uh, for instance, the, the use of masculine and the doors of perception, it's more that the, our experience so far in humanity with these types of drugs has been demonized by the Reagan, um, the war on drugs and, and those kind of things. But there used to be actually like legal study surrounding these topics and looking at how they can help with, for instance, PTSD, how they can help with. There, there's, there are actually benefits to the use of it, and especially also creatively. You see people that have used it that have became creative geniuses. And I think that process of, it's the same as, for instance, listening to classical music and opening that door. It's it's funny you mentioned this this war on drugs. Um, America is is very anti drugs, but at the same time there's so much pharmaceutical uh, the, these opioid crises mm-hmm. uh, crises and there's this new I believe it's yeah, a Netflix yeah, yeah. documentary about no or, or is it the movie uh, the the oxycotton I believe oh yeah that's that's with Purdue that's uh, dope sick yeah, yeah, with exactly. uh, Michael Keaton. Um, yeah, and and it's it's something we in our novels we wanted to touch on these points in a bigger Illuminati kind of like idea. Yeah, I might use this one day, but yeah, let's let's not for now. No, definitely. Uh, let's get into the Batarians. Yeah, we used to work on a world that some point we had the ambition to at least create four novels. That didn't pan out, but then <laughs> we gave the world to you. And I, I still help you with like little things. And and now you have be- four, again, beautifully crafted short stories. One of them is, you can read it now, and I highly recommend that you do. Would, would you want to tell us first, where did the initial idea of the Batharians even come from? <laughs> that goes way back. We were writing the youth together about Brodo and Dairion. You can hear more about this in the last episode, at least. Like the last episode, we talked quite at length about it. Yeah, exactly. Um, so, uh, at the end of the first part of the story, uh, their father gets killed and they, they find this bullet 
and they track the bullet to I, I think the, the English word is... Chopwood. <laughs> there is There would have been a better name if we wrote it in English. But <laughs> Yeah, they had to go there. I don't even know if we really had a reason why. It was just, yeah, that bullet comes from there. Yeah, we do. I, I can tell you what it was. The assassin killed someone and he took his identity as a traitor from Cop, Cop Out. Like uh, Chopwood. Yes, yes, that, and that he had it. the whole, like, the, the art thing and... Brodor even had like conversation with him and then he went to like the top of the tower and then he he did his little assassination thing shot the uh, father of the Brodor and Dairion. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So yeah, he gets killed and uh, Brodor and Dairion they had to uh, track the bullet. At the time you were I, I think you were in a in a relationship or you didn't have much time to write and I was like okay, I'm going to finish the second part of the story, uh, up until uh, Hackwood. Uh, I will call it Hackwood. You may, you might call it Chopwood. Um, I think I think neither are great names, but it doesn't matter. <laughs> like let's let's give it a name. It's it's. I stepped in once again when we did like our gum and Henrik. The reason why I stepped out was because I was doing my internship and I had to do crazy hours. I just had a new relationship. It was not the greatest one there were a lot of things that just kept me away and i also didn't have the healthiest work ethic in terms of writing uh so uh they went there and they had to cross all these these different terrains so then you're starting to think okay what could be there and created these these ruins and the people that lived there were the zelanians i call them they were a bit inspired by two things uh, at the time i was playing uh, GTA 5 uh, and there was this I believe it was an Asian guy and you had to pick him up with your car and I, I don't I believe it was Trevor he was talking to the guy and the guy said absolutely nothing then a second thing I read at the same time was that Albert Einstein didn't talk until he was uh, five or six years old and I combined these two I, I was thinking mm, this, this is actually Kind of interesting, just a, a people that only think and rarely ever talk. Yeah. Uh, so that was the basis for these these ruins. And yeah, they, they explored it a little bit. Or I believe there was an archaeologist who, uh, who explained everything. But then I started to think, okay, who would their enemies be? Mm -hmm. You were doing Aikido. Yes. Because you wanted to be Steven Seagal. No, 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 no. I did Aikido because I had done judo, jujitsu. I've done, I've done quite a few things to quite far degree. But then Aikido was the thing where I thought that was the beautiful idea of you're not trying to seek out the fight. If someone attacks you, you continue their movement without trying to harm them, just to show them that the violence itself is kind of futile. So you use their energy against them. Exactly. And and this philosophy, I, I find it really interesting. Like there's this force coming and there are two ways to stop the force. It's just to let it continue or to stop it with a shield. Exactly. And the Zelanians were kind of like, let it just go and, and let, it, let the fire die down. Mm -hmm. And then there was this other uh, people and they later evolved into the Batarians. Yeah. I think I believe I call them Grun Batarians. Yeah. Which was another thing I, I found at the moment was these Lichtenberg figures that are caused when you get struck by lightning. And I thought yeah, it, it would be really cool just to have this, this god and you have to prove yourself to this god by getting struck by lightning. I even think that this came because the assassin was hired by a Chthonian and he had his acolytes. And we had seven acolytes and they all did this trial. And let me add one thing, uh, because the Chthonians... They were the bad guys of the story. Exactly. I don't I don't think we, we explained this, but the Chthonians, you had the Asaurians, they were the Brother and Darion side, and you had the Chthonians, they were just yeah, the evil with Warlord Kagas. Uh, yeah, but he he didn't exist at that moment. He didn't? Oh. It was later we, we, we One thing why I wanted to say this is because we had the Chthonians and the Chthonians were a modern day version of the the Krumbatarians. So we kind of reverse engineered it. I think I, I first had this this sort of ancient civilization of of warmongering people getting struck by lightning and and having these these sort of berserker elites. Yeah, of of, of power. I, I think I made it to Hackwood. Then at the point we just got stuck. Stop the story, and we were like, okay, let's go back to Asoria. Write this new story about a hunter. Argom 
Do we? Well, we we actually finished it. Uh, we yeah. we only had to edit it, but we were getting so insecure, and we we started to create more and more and more and more uh, up until we thought, nah, this is not going to work. This is getting even bigger than the previous story. So we started a new one about yeah. the captain. Yeah, that also didn't work. And I think we just decided, we just quit. And we were like, yeah, you get this one and you get that one. I started to, these Batarians, I find them interesting because I, I don't want to have, well, let's say orcs or cannon fodder. Yeah. Also, because the, I had the Kun Batarians, which were more, it, it also sounds orcish or a bit harsh. And I started to think, how do I want this to sound? Mm-hmm. Because in, in my opinion, it's it's really important how something sounds. Because if you have these these harsh, yeah, these these sounds, it gives a sort of evil, or at least in in our perspective, an, an, an evil sounding people. And and I didn't want that. Now we're getting into the meat of the episode. The idea, of what we started with, is how can we get like to the Kazakh Doom, the the the, the Orkish, and the, mm. the even the Klingon things from Star Trek. Like, how can you get to a war society, and how would what would this sound like? And the and the heavy things. That's why we have Kagas and the, like those, like a lot of the Ks and the and those kind of things were inside that yeah. the way that everything sounded. I thought, okay, I'm going to inspire this a little bit by Spartans as well. So I tapped into the Greek language or ancient ancient Greek language. And I thought, yeah, Kroon is not really something that sounds Greek, but Batharians could be something ancient Greek. Yeah, Spartan society. And everything started sounding a lot more streamlined and to the point, which the, that society is as well. It's all very stripped down based to the bare minimum that you need as a warrior. You get like a, a room with no furniture in it except for a bed. And we all share everything communally. Mm-hmm. I think that that is one of the bigger things that we sh- we saw while still having tribes that thought very differently. And that's like a part that I would love to talk about as well, which is a big turning point now, I think, for your second short story. How did the world, that society, how did that change because of this story? And how did your philosophy towards how you would create these four short stories, how did that change? I I wanted to make it kind of realistic. Just a, okay, what's the ultimate power that that someone can get? And it started with the lightning. But then I started to think, okay, what are other elements? And... Mm -hmm. Yeah, of course, you got fire, ice, water, you name it. I, I, I got 14 of them, mm-hmm. uh, which I'm still thinking about if I should do it, because recently you brought something up. But yeah, it was just these elements had a different god attached to it. Mm-hmm. And I'm I'm just now finishing the lore of what is exactly the lore behind the gods and what are they working to, uh, towards. Because at, at that point, I just created a pantheon, a sort of Olympian's, and yeah, that was it. But yeah, I'm, I'm just now figuring out, okay, w- what's the ultimate goal of, uh, what's their eschatological, so their end of the world, their Ragnarok kind of, yeah, ultimate. You started with the trial of Texas and can you, can you explain a little bit about the lore behind Texas as a, a god? Just to let people understand one of those trials, for instance. Yeah, it's, it's well, <laughs> there's, there's nothing much to it. It's a sort of a lightning god. And I inspired yeah. him a little bit by Thor. I, cre- I created two gods, Phaistos and Texas. Texas is the one in the clouds. He's, he's actually the kind of the Zeus of the of the Batarians, which is uh, which is also a lightning god. And Phaistos the the fire one. So what I what I created is is Phaistos is the one in the ground creating volcanoes. And when he got he's a miner. And when he got his his ores. He throws them up in the air and uh, Texas uses these metals to uh, beat his anvil and, and create weapons or armor. or And that's what sparks, yeah, the, 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 the sparks are, are the lightning, which is actually yeah just the same as uh, Thor. But I, I looked into other religions. Can I make it something, something different? And I believe in some Native American cultures... Uh, lightning is is a god with a with a flashing rope or or a spear or something and i just yeah it, uh, to me especially for a, for warmongering society beating an anvil and creating weapons was the most logical thing to do then we find ourselves with 6 and 11 and 6 and 11 are basically 
protagonists and antagonists. Yeah, and because you keep calling them 6 and 11, uh, which <laughs> which is correct. But to explain that, Batarians, they reach their manhood when they are 15. And when they're 15, they need to go to this trial. And a lot of them will die. Not a lot of people yeah. survive getting struck by lightning. So at birth, they're just giving a number. They're nothing. They're just a number. And only if the gods deem them worthy, they get their name. But up until that yeah. point, they, they get... Not much to eat because uh, when you have a, a warmongering society, the real soldiers, they need to eat. So if you're under 15, yeah, you just get all the all the leftovers, probably like like uh, blood broth. Yeah, it's, it's like the the food is made also from like basically the products that are used less in the wastage of... Yeah. In the same way as how you have like a, a very expensive part of the pig that goes to the rich and a cheaper part of the pig that goes to the poor. That kind of idea. Or, yeah. Like there's a, there's a lot of hist- in history that does that actually. Yeah, exactly. And so now now people know why you call them 6 and 11. And they're the, the 6 and 11th kid in that kind of... That team, that squad. Yeah, yeah. Perfect. Okay, now that all makes sense. So we have 6 and 11, and they're both fighting uh, for the same girl. But 6, I believe, actually has a chance with this girl. And the other one, the only way that he would win her is if he would just be there quicker. If he would come back from the trials quicker, I think, right? 11 is the is the protagonist, and 6 is the antagonist. And yeah, I call them, (laughs) there's also, uh, people might consider this uh, misogynistic, which uh, might be true, but I call them uh, birthing wives. Because in their society, and it's it's not a utopia I'm creating, it's just something that I could imagine in such a society. So childbirth is is very dangerous to a woman as well. But (laughs) since so many boys die when they return they have to have multiple women just to make as much children as possible and yeah women are are actually seen as just baby factories and also if you think about the logic behind it if we look at historical portrayal of the role of women in society that is sadly just how a lot of women that was back in the days women were seen as I don't know, baby factories, but there was just something not as equal to women. So it is just also, you know, we're, we we want to go to a place where there is a lot of equality as something we talked about in like, what if there wasn't religion, there would be a lot of less of a difference between the role in society for a man and a woman and whether you're gay or not or anything. Mm-hmm. But before we can go to that place, we do want to have that arc of growth that certain societies did go through that arc of growth. Certain societies didn't. And uh, I think that that was also a part where we started from. Like, they're the bad guys, so they might have less of a maturity in that sense. Mm-hmm. The Patharians were barbarians, basically. Well, it's it, I don't know if it's what they are, but what we could consider. It's ancient, ancient Greeks were viewed as, as very sophisticated, and they do have this, but they also have this, this primitive worldview of women well they they don't exactly have no respect for women because women also are the the poets of the oh they are the voice of the generation they're the they sing the legends yeah exactly and if you uh, and i think i described this as well in the story yeah if if you have a great birthing wife then the most the most useless soldier could come forward as the biggest victor just because a birthing wife can can create these stories of grandeur first que- like i have two questions though by the way and sorry for derailing yeah. this conversation constantly yeah. but was because i've i've just realized that Barth- batharian and barbarian sounds quite alike was this intentional by the way in the naming because for me it's something that i didn't realize until i'm saying it now no i i, I created the croon batharians and i yeah. i just dropped the croon yeah and now it's batharian but i think this is something subconscious that happens just with like naming and and how we yeah probably we kind of but but the second question that I uh, had is because we like I know that this was a year ago when you started writing these short stories, mm-hmm. and I know that we I, at least I was still in Antwerp when we had the conversation about six and eleven and how for me the first draft of the story felt like it was very female and friendly, and I think we had like quite a lot of conversations about whether that's a good thing a bad thing, but we did have quite a conversation about it. How much did that become part of? the evolution of that story from the first draft to what it is now it didn't i'm i'm not creating a utopia and i think you can 
yeah, you can create the most female unfriendly society in the world if it's if it's just it's not my perfect world that I'm describing. It's just a world I'm describing. Yeah which has multiple elements and they all come together. And I think that that is the most realistic part of how this, this world can be. It's, it's not my utopia. I'm, I'm yeah, I, I would not want women to have no rights or, or be seen as, as baby factories. Exactly. No, it's, it's, I think it's also, there's a lot of stories that even have different ways of looking at it. Um, Aldous Huxley, I mentioned with Brave New World, where sexuality is perceived very differently and like uh, th there's no importance in being special to someone. Like the, the, everyone should be very open about sex and everyone should have, should have sex with each other as long as they're in a certain caste. And even uh, The Handmaid's still has kind of like a dystopia surrounded the place mm -hmm. of women in society. So I think it's also this thing of, it's a very open source way of talking about what a society can be, has been, as we mentioned before as well. Yeah, well, it, it might be my, my personal view. I'm, I'm not really a hedonistic person. Mm -hmm. I, I'm not a pleasure seeker. <laughs> Quite the opposite, actually. And, I, and that's just, I think, suffering creates better art than, than yeah. pleasure. I think the, the I'm not going to spoil the ending, but I think the ending of the story, in a sense, uh, almost a Greek tragedy, it could not exist without that society being so cruel. Yeah, lo love, uh, love doesn't exist. Well, love does exist, but it's well, you, it's it's kind of taboo, yeah. and it's it's viewed just as a as a pragmatic thing. Just love, love is a byproduct of of, cre of of creating babies. It's almost this thing of like boxers, and you shouldn't have sex before a fight. Like you should have sex just to procreate, and that's basically the stance of the Batharians. And you shouldn't, you should have a certain respect for each other. Definitely. I think it's also like in that, that there is respect for women. Definitely. Because they're treated quite well in that society as, as they're taking better care of than I think men are at a younger age. Because they, we need women to mm -hmm. fulfill a certain role in that society. But yeah, there's, there's this, there's this interesting dynamic of how then that society treats it, and how we have this outlier in society, which is eleven, that looks quite differently. And they look, they, I think that's interesting. You have these outliers of society that look quite differently from from their perspective towards the Witherian society, thus helping us as an outsider understand better how that society works because we question things from the view of that protagonist. I think that's something that comes back a lot in those short stories, doesn't it? I, I think every protagonist has to climb a certain mountain. Yes, but I think that, for instance... Um, it's always going against the status quo in every story. We need a protagonist that, that, that doesn't understand the world as well as others do. We need someone from kind of like a, a virgin standpoint or like, a, like how Bilbo doesn't know the world because he's never seen it. And then he goes into the world and he goes to the adventure. Luke, who's always been a, a farmer and then goes into this galactic universe, this great adventure and then understands the empire and those kind of things. It's the same as the next story that you're gonna that you're gonna bring out from the the mm. Heimelon, which has. Would you want to explain the role of the little kid? Just so because you you're also kind of like in the development of what that would be. I think. Yes. Yeah, so so the second story is the Heimelon, which is a mm -hmm. sort of they they live in the in the northern in the northern icy wastes of Laganea, which is the the ice the goddess of ice. Mm -hmm. Yeah, his his little. I call it the Dumayat. It's it's sort of a, a small walled city which holds the the native people of the land, and they work for him. At some at some point, it would it would kind of feel like either a Viking taking over the land, and then the the people that lived in that land working for the Vikings, or maybe even like an analog towards samurai and the people underneath that, and the history of where the shinobis and everything came from as well, where there was like a type of rebellion. But that that kind of relationship where. You have stewards over. So the natives get get yeah. their, turned into into serfs, and and the, the Kaimuron is kind of based on a samurai, and they're stewards of a land for the shogun. Yeah, basically, which is the Kothon. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. And yeah, the uh, yeah the little village, the walled village, the Dumayata, uh, it's completely mm -hmm. obliterated because there is a war in the south, and they want to. Yeah, it's sort of a Viking people that want to cut off all the resources, so all the horses, all the the, the food from the north gets cut off and they just destroy all these these villages. Uh, so in the south they have an advantage. But this 
Kaimuron, he, he gets alarmed, he fights off the intruders and he finds everyone, everyone dead except for mm. one little boy. His stable, uh, I think it's a it's a groom. Um, either way, it's like a servant in the stables. Like it's it's one of those kids that would just yeah, exactly. uh, calm the horses and and train them for the to keep them re- war ready, basically. Yeah, he he just has the kid, and even though he's he's this old stoic, uh, phlegmatic, yeah, a batarian, which is just hardened by the war, he's like, yeah, well, I I cannot leave this kid here, so he he takes him with him and yeah they yeah they, they go try to find out uh, like okay wh- where is this attack coming from and they track down the general of, of yes that army and this is in a different time or this is also a different time from 6 and 11 yeah i, I didn't really create mm-hmm. a, a timeline it's it's or uh, i did create a timeline but it's it's not really important it's just a different region and a different different moment inside that history of the Batharians to explain who the Batharians are almost anthologically. And then we have the Daughters of Hess, which is about a tribe created from... It's actually a result of the discussion we had about, okay, is this society misogynistic? Mm-hmm. And then creating a, a tribe of... Yeah, well, cre- creating a new land of these, these birthing wives. Yeah. Which becomes its own tribe. Yeah, so so their husbands, they lost the war and they escape from the camp. Because everyone is, is so indoctrinated. When you lose, yeah, you just sit in your tent and you just wait for the for the victor to come and, and take us, make uh, yeah, enslave us. One of them decides, well, let's let's not sit and wait. Let's just run. Yeah, let's, let's try to save us as much as possible. And yeah, they run for a few days uh, with all these these women that are uh, some are pregnant, some are wounded, uh, and they they, uh, they they find this tree and there's this little hut and there's an old woman living there. So the women that that starts this journey uh, gets wounded and she's yeah on the, on the brink of death at the moment when she arrives there. Uh, and and yeah. yeah, they they knock on the door. There's no one there. Uh, so they find all these these potions and, and tinctures. So they they try to they take refuge there. Yeah, they they heal her, and then at a certain point, there's this old woman, and they believe it's Hess. And whether it's it's Hess, yeah. the goddess Hess, I'll leave that up to the reader and up to the women in the story. They believe it's her. Yeah, the goddess queen of yeah of of women actually. The the sort of heart like the the refuge for women. To bring them safe yeah. uh, passage through the lands, basically, until they find their own Walhalla, kind of that idea. Yeah, they they ask, yeah, can we live here? Uh, where we're being hunted by yeah by all these these men, and yeah, they they just start building a new village, and that's the story. And uh, it's it's just building a village from the ground up, creating a new society. And of course, like like eleven, there are there are a lot of men that just want to live with their wife. They really believe in love, and they they come there, and they have the advantage of being ready for battle. So yeah, that's that's how this society slowly grows. And I think even if you look at it, it shows the transformation of a society as a whole to become a little bit more mature, as we talked about before with the Catonians mm. and the, the Selenians and, and, you know, then, then growing up to become the Catonians, in a sense, to become a more mature society. It's, it's that interesting point in history where you see people questioning their own mm. norms. I think that's what a lot of the story is about as well, at least what I took out of it. Because every time there's a decision at a certain point, and it's a very moral, ethical decision where people are questioning, is this the way that we want to move forward? Is this a smart thing to do? And it's there's something there that once you once that unravels, it kind of gives you an answer of whether it was a smart thing to do. And it kind of, it's in itself kind of a, f- a philosophy thing that happens there, I think, right? And then we have companion piece to Texas, which is Festos, the mountain of Festos, the last story that will... Uh, yeah, exactly. And that's about the down- the downfall of the empire. But I'm now that I'm fleshing out the Pantheon uh, a bit more, I get a really mm-hmm. a lot of new ideas for that story because it's just I wanted to write a story about the downfall of the empire and then go to the Azanians. I'm, I'm thinking, okay... 
this probably is going to be a uh, more it's probably going to be the biggest story up until this point it's the smallest but i think i'm going to maybe go to all these stories have 10,000 words i think i'm going with this one I aim for 25,000 and maybe do it back to back with the Azanian story. Have have it have the downfall mm -hmm. of the empire from two two perspectives. But yeah, for for now yes. I I only have one yeah one perspective. But it's about as a sort of sending away and passing the torch as well. I yeah, think, yeah, right? yeah, exactly. But what I wanted to do is touch on how they view homosexuality because that in ancient Greece was normal as it should be. It's, mm -hmm. it's everywhere in nature, but yeah, have, have, not having a religion. So they're kind of misogynistic towards women, if, yeah, if you look at it from our perspective. But for a yeah. homosexual relationship, it's, yeah, they're, they're just, they're, they're, there's no love. So everything is, is pragmatic. Uh, so you can be with a man or a woman if it's just going towards the end goal. It doesn't really matter who you're with. But this was inspired by Zeus. I, I read this story of Stephen Fry. He, he has the Heroes and the Mythos books. And I read about uh, Ganymede, who was a lover of Zeus. And I, th I thought to myself, mm -hmm. Zeus is, is really a character or a god which is just just manlyhood he's always going to be the embodiment of he's the the biggest broadest he even in like the new thor love and thunder he's the one that completely just like he he can annihilate thor if he wanted yeah. to he, like at a flick of her finger he can do whatever he wants to thor yeah he's, he's just viewed as a, as a man man and and it's it's probably also because of the disney uh, of, of hercules that that i'm i'm viewing this but it's just i don't know i i view him as a very manly god and him having a homosexual relationship, I, I thought, okay, how can I make a, a very strong male character, which has a, he does have a lot of kids, but in, in, in basis, he, he feels more towards men. He gets more pleasure from men and he gets, he, he fulfills his duty towards women. If that's the way to word it. I, I, I think he's, he's really in love with, with this other, other man. It's, it's not just this pragmatic view and... He is the highest, he's, he's the Kothan, he's, he's the highest of the highest in, in this society. And I just wanted to create a, a, a gay character. Also, I, I don't know if I'm the authority for uh, the, the queer community to create. <laughs> Um, definitely not no but uh, I mean I as I, I just want to show support as a heterosexual man like okay I I want to give this to uh yeah to the to the queer community and I don't know if it works when I'm done I I really would like to receive some feedback from yeah maybe on reddit uh, queer uh, because there's I believe a lot of queer fantasy mm -hmm. But yeah, I, I, I just wanted to create not this this stereotypical homosexual man that you that you yeah often see in media, I think. Mm -hmm. Or well there there's there's two things. It's either uh, lesbians when when uh, when heterosexual men want to want to be uh, woke kind of um, they, they create a homosexual character, it's it's always two women. Yeah. But that's that's how I perceive it. I, I don't know if this is Correct. So I, yeah, I just wanted to have a homosexual male character. I think it's also from the way that I see it, it's almost this thing of making a comment on, look, we had Roman society and Greek society, which were all okay with this. And in history, this mm -hmm. was something that was completely not weird. And in nature. Just kind of using, yes, in nature, just using those things, those facts as a statement of, look, that it is weird that we find this such a topic of, like you mentioned in the last episode, who has sex with who and why is gender such a conversation in this? Why are we making this such a weird thing while we already had this figured out way, way, mm -hmm. way, 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 like years and decades ago? Why has it, why have we retrograded in, in a sense? in morality why is this such a weird thing now and why why do we have to why do we have to now find a way to balance it to the other side where we're we're kind of why do we have to make this such a weird thing or like a unique thing to talk about why can't this just be as normal as talking about cake or talking about grocery shopping or why is this such a focus point and i think that using all those things in history as an inspiration to say this has always been normal in every way that you can see mm. it and now we find us in a weird place of society where it's this thing of am i woke enough a a am i kind enough about it and it's a way of saying hey you know in your fantasy world and in your 
society to creating here. This is a normal thing. Am I am I right in in the way that I'm? It just exists. It's it's not it's it's not something to have an opinion about. It's just ex it exists. Uh, and yeah, that that's it. It exists in nature. It exists in men. As someone that has been able to read all four short stories, I think that's a very common theme because you start introducing this society as a arguably questionable towards women questionable towards a lot of things that we 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 try to champion these days and everything in a sense and even questionable about how how should men be as parents and and the deadening of media there's a lot of things that were that you're touching upon which kind of looks at what does it mean to be a man what does it mean to be a woman what does it mean to be what does it mean to be a person and how how has this society challenged those things? It's a part of that because a lot of it is about fighting and what is your quality? What's your added value? And it, I think even in Argom, we've, we've kind of tried to find that the best way to deal with that is normalcy. The more normal you treat that as that, the better it gets for the society as a whole. Yeah, and I, I think this is also happening in, in this society. I, I also believe in, um, I, I used to be, when I, when I saw two gay men kissing, I was like, mm, is this necessary? Do I really need to see this? But which, is, which is like 15 years ago or something. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. But 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 just this yeah also kind of conservative view about it and yeah do I want to see people kissing in the street I don't, I don't know when you're exposed to to yeah to gay couples it just it just normalizes I'm like yeah, okay I I don't care anymore it's a, it's this thing as well that I think you, we come from a quite small village which has gotten city rights and everything but it's still a very small minded village way of looking at things it's a very like still influenced yeah, by religion, rural. agriculture does. Yeah, it's a very rural way of looking at things. And sorry, but in a lot of those places, it's a very conservative mm. way of looking at sexuality. And especially 10, 12 years ago, there wasn't a whole conversation about, like I, I had this whole thing where I was called very feminine and gay in a lot of schools. That was how I was viewed. Because conversation around that and the perception of what is gay and what is feminine. If you wore pink, you were already very gay. And that is not something that like I, I at some point I was like, hey, I, I don't want to be seen as gay because then I, I don't get the same opportunity that, as I would like with women. But I was also probably wearing a pink shirt because it's like, hey, if you want me to be like, I, I don't care. I don't believe I don't I don't register with that train of thought that if you wear pink or that anything in behavior or anything attributes to your sexuality or anything. No, I, I like women. So I am who I am. And I think that's something that we challenged from uh, from the beginning as well. And I think you've always challenged that as well, that what does it mean to be a person? Yeah, and I think... It also has to do with uh, living in a more rural area. There's more poverty, so people have other things uh, on their mind than being woke or being... They just need to get around and, and earn money to survive. Yeah, but also masculinity is just shown in like... Like rural work is very yeah. physical work. So it just attributes to... And, and especially if you look further down in history, men used to do a lot of work... A lot of rural work is done. So men are like the woodchuckers, the farmers. Mm -hmm. Like we have a stereotypical way of yeah. looking at it through society. And then we've grown up to kind of see these things very differently. Yeah, it, it kind of does create a stereotype. Yeah, exactly. But um, yeah, that, that's, that's the Batarians. Thank you for taking us through this journey of how that evolved. I mean, already the, the Chimeron and what type of responsibility does a... A, a like a samurai or like a viking have over his people and beneath him and and a little boy and how someone that is i saw this yesterday as well in star trek where in star trek picard he is introduced and he kind of like shows himself as he doesn't doubt himself as a captain but he does as a person and this is one way of how this is shown is that he says i am not good with children and i am sorry towards his doctor who has a kid which is uh, wesley crusher and it's something that i found very very interesting because it's almost this kind of one who is like hey i am not good with children and that's like kind of his journey throughout this which is something that we've seen now in the last of us as well and with god of war kratos and his son but it's this very, very nice thing of like, what does it mean to be a father? What does it mean to be a man? People need to read that story. While you are waiting for uh, the second story, they can find the first story on talesofacid.com. I want to plug it again. 
And I also would like to thank everyone for listening. Yes, a little bit of a longer episode, but still, thank you for listening. If you enjoyed the video, consider liking it and perhaps even subscribing to our channel. This will help us understand what people like and create better content for you as a listener. This was From a Rise Perspective and see you in the next one.